we just had a really, really interesting session upstairs, chaired by uh, my friend Rick, um, Rick Rosso. And we touched on a lot of things in terms of trade, in terms of investment. Things are looking up. Or there are certain you know, fissures and stuff, but it gets worked out. Um, but on the, we'll focus this, this thing on the economic part of, of the story. Um, I came to DC from a very unknown institute called the National Institute of Public Finance and Policy. <laughs> uh, only one person who knew it was Rick Rosso. And I came to this uh, city without a job. And one day, we went out for coffee, and we said, uh, he said, what do you, what do, you do in, 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 in India? I said, well, I work for an IPFP. The only person who knew about it was him. And he said, so what are you doing? I said, I'm unemployed. He said, OK, so then we should start doing something. Because I think there is a lot in, this, in DC that is left unsaid about the Indian economy, and especially what's happening within India, the processes. And what are the changes that are happening structurally which is very difficult to understand lo looking at um, just the newspaper articles or blogs or, or posts. So I think we have a, a fantastic panel here, and this is exactly what we are going to do. We have Dr. Mukesh Aghi, um, who runs the USIPF, USISPF. Uh, it's a strategic and partnership forum, and I think I like the name because it is a strategic and partnership forum. So I think the strategic part is important, and the partnership part is even more important. And I would like to have his thoughts on from looking at it from this part, from, from here into India, the foggy window, as, as we heard in the last panel. How does it look like, and what have been the changes? And then I'll come to Bhavani uh, Parmeshwar, who is actually an implementer. I mean, you're, you've been in, the, in ITC for many years, and um, you've also, you are on the board of ITC Tech. So it's a technology company, and technology has been one of the bedrocks of India's economy, and you have seen it from the inside. So we'll have a perspective from you. And as a chartered accountant, um, I think GST has been good. If my chartered accountant refused to file my taxes because he was too you know, busy filing GST um, tax, uh, filings this year, and he was making more money than filing an NRI taxes. <laughs> so I think it would be also interesting to hear what it means, what this GST means for people in the country and for companies especially. And third and not, last but not the least, sir, um, it's Dr. Anup Singh. And again, going back to my NIPFP days, we used to run this conference called Issues Before the X Finance Commission. So you substitute X for whichever finance commission it was. So I organized the meeting called Issues Before the 13th Finance Commission. So which gives out how old I am. Um, but he's the member of the 15th Finance Commission. And if anybody in the audience doesn't know, Finance Commission is one of the most amazing and important institutions that India has. It determines the share and the distribution of taxes between the central government and the states. Now, if you think that's an easy job, it's not. And therefore, we are very, very happy that Dr. Anup Singh is here. He also has been for many years at IMF and the World Bank and Director for Asia Pacific. So we would also like to hear from him about his perspective and now being on the inside and how, what, what you feel about the economy. So I'll start with Dr. Agi first, and then we'll come down five and minutes. for about five minutes, and then I'll have a round of questions. Well, good afternoon. I, I think uh, when you look at India, IMF announced that India is going to grow 75 to 8% next year. And uh, everybody's applauding, which is good, but you have to look at it from a broader perspective. One is you have lack of job creation at an 8% growth. And to me, that's a big challenge. Roughly a million workers are coming into the job market, and around 500,000 are getting jobs. The other 500,000 are getting into unemployment pool. And that unemployment pool is roughly around 24 million Indians which is growing on a month basis. So that's, that's one aspect of the challenge. This government has taken the lead on trying to do a lot of structural reforms, GST, insolvency. Uh, you look at uh, trying to bring the inflation under control, uh, budget deficit before, uh, below 3%. So it has been a responsible government which is focused on trying to bring structural reform. And I would say that 
as we move forward, the biggest challenge the government is going to have is, is how do you basically create more jobs in an economy which is growing at 7 8%. And I think our analysis shows the economy has to grow around 10% uh, to be able to absorb. The other big, uh, uh, I would say, tsunami coming in the Indian environment is roughly 400 million Indians are going to move from villages to the city in the next 10 years. And uh, just look at Delhi as a city. It adds around 1,000 vehicles on a daily basis. And the city is, is kind of getting more congested. Uh, if you look at the pollution, you look at the health services, you look at the education services, it is at the stretch level. And if you have uh, roughly 400 million Indians moving next 10 years, it is going to be a challenge. I, I think the government's intentions are right. They're trying to make sure that they have fiscal responsibility. Uh, they're trying to bring that discipline uh, within the uh, administration itself. With the election coming in, they've been very cautious to make sure that they don't go ahead and basically have farm waivers program and other, um, uh, what I call is the election gimmicks itself. So just to paint the picture, I, I, I think uh, when you look at uh, overall business impact on GST, which was on the constraining part, it has now getting better and better, and they're able to release uh, money they've taken from the SME, SME, especially who got choked on GST implementation. Now the exports are picking up. I think the challenge I see is as the world gets less and less globalized, India has to somehow figure out how to basically increase domestic consumption to drive that. But it will need a lot of investment and that's where we're looking at U.S. corporation moving into India and try to bring that investment. If you look, uh, India was the number one recipient of uh, FDI, $63 billion last year. And in 2016, India got almost $33 billion investment from the U.S. companies itself. And India invested in the U.S. roughly $12.6 billion. So we see the activity of the economy picking up but I think it needs to pick up much faster to be able to handle job creation. Thanks. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for having me here. Um, you know, we're heading into an election year in India, and it's interesting that we're talking about economic outlook here. In an election when economic outlook may not even be a factor, it may be fought on many gut level issues. But regardless, you know, from um, my point of view, since um, Mukesh already raised the issue of GST and so on, I'll throw out a couple of other structural um, issues, which is really integrated rural development, which is like the mother of all issues. 52% of India's workforce is in agriculture, accounting for only about 14% of GDP. And 80% of India's poor, which is about one in five, live in, uh, in rural areas. How do we actually look at schemes and initiatives and structural uh, reforms which have, um, uh, which have a direct impact on the rural economy? So the Prime Minister's initiatives in the last couple of years, one being the doubling of farm incomes by 2022, and the other one, of course, is the Make in India initiative. But there are lots of things that are um, at the confluence of this. One being job creation itself, the other being digitization, uh, reaching benefits directly to the uh, beneficiaries, you know. Um, World Bank's Findex report, I think, came out in the last week. And yesterday, right? So that basically said, that 55% of all bank accounts opened in the last three years has been in India. Now, 80% of um, you know, Indian adults, which is about nearly 900 million, 80% of them have a bank account. This was only about 33% in uh, 2011, you know, as recently as 2011. How does this change the metric for everybody, both public and private institutions, right? Now, 75% um, of all subsidies go into the farm sector. 
payments or subsidies. Now, how effective can that be to double their income from $1,500 in 2016 to a $3,000, $3,200 in 2022? That requires huge structural reforms and changes. Sort of the mother of GST is in the APMC, you know, which is the Agricultural Produce uh, Market Councils. There are so many variations of it uh, in each state, and uh, you know, APMC is competing rather within to keep their monopolies. There is no, uh, we need rationalization of fees, we need licensing garages to end. Um, if agriculture needs to be connected to markets in order for this huge workforce to benefit, we need to have reforms there first. And that's one, uh, we speak uh, from experience, you know, ITC is an exemplar in farmer engagement as well as in, you know, um, agri initiatives. So I'll be happy to talk about it as we go along. But really, rural is where I think the action is. All right, thanks very much. Uh, let me start by saying it's great you're doing this on India. It's the second year, I think, for Dorsan and for Iran. So my congratulations on that. In my time at the IMF, I got used to talking about China uh, in Washington the whole time. So this is great. Uh, OK. I agree with all that I've, I've just heard from Mukesh and Bhavani, but let me put this in a different perspective. Okay, India is now growing about 7.4%, and that's great. Uh, IMF says it could go up to 7.8% in the next one year or two years. Now let's look at um, why, in, why India can't go faster, or is India going close to its capacity? So economists calculate what is called the potential output or the potential growth rate. By most estimates, whether the IMF or anybody else, the potential output or potential growth rate of India today is probably 7.4. It may rise uh, to 7.5 to 8. So but the point I'm making is India is currently growing at about its ability and capacity to grow without having unsustainable things happening. So my point is that we should not worry. About, now, why is it that India's potential growth is only seven and a half and not more? Well, there are many reasons. But if you look across Asia in the last five years, even though Asia remains a growth leader compared to the rest of the world, you see productivity has been falling, productivity growth rate has been falling in many countries, especially in China, but also India in the last five years. So the focus for Asia and India and especially China is to reverse this to get productivity growth rising faster. Now the issue is, what do countries have to do? Uh, productivity depends on lots of things. It depends on investment. But be careful. Don't ask for more investment, because we're seeing in China and other countries, investment-led growth is often debt-led growth. And that leads to unproductive growth. You need labor. Of course, India will constitute apparently one quarter of the increase in the global labor force the next five years will be Indian. Because half of India's population is below 25 years of age. The point I'm making is don't only focus on more investment. You need to raise productivity in India desperately. And why? What do I mean by that? I mean, productivity is a, is a term that can mean a hundred things. Well, if you're an economist, you know what I mean. I'm making only one point. Low productivity generally develops because there's misallocation of resources. So if the resources you have are being misallocated and you increase resources, 
in a misallocated way, you are not going to get productive growth that will support jobs. So the issue for India is you've got to reduce the misallocation. And when people talk of structural reforms, which India needs, and so does so China, the issue is simply one, to make it very simple. You've got to improve the allocation of resources so the resources that are available do not go to the highly unproductive enterprises, state-owned enterprises, and drive away new startups and new activities that will be highly productive. So the issue for India is what kind of structural reforms are needed to do that. The GST is certainly one of that. Before I finish, let me make one more point. As you look across India, you look at India state by state. I'm not looking from the point of view of my mandate now in the, in the commission. But if you look across India, you see that as an internal market, India is not very policy unified. You see labor laws, land laws, and everything else, different state by state. What does that do? It drives away good investment. So what India needs to do is, number one, to improve the allocation of resources. That will lead to a huge jump in productive investment, growth, and jobs. And I think that has to be the main focus. We should worry more about productivity and resource misallocation and unifying the market within India to keep growth going and to raise productivity. So when people tell you India needs more investment, yes, India does. But it has to be the right investment. India needs more labor, of course, it has a labor. It needs the skills that will give jobs in areas you spoke about, in technology. So the issue comes down to productivity has been falling in Asian countries in China. In India, it's kind of stabilized and gone up slightly. It has to go up in the next 10 years. Wonderful. Um, so for the students here uh, and who are thinking of topics to write your master's thesis, I have several. Jobless growth, urbanization, service delivery, digitization, APMC, rural productivity, productivity, state-owned enterprises, misallocation of resources. So pick your, take I think your you pick. you should add sustained, sustainable capacity building. Sustainable capacity building. So unpack all that. Find out what you want to work on. So at least one motive for you to sit in this, uh, sit through this panel has been served. So, but I'll come back to you for questions and please ask the hard questions. But let me, let me just have, start again from this side. Um, Dr. Singh, you said, you, you said rightly about productivity, right? Um, and you were uh, the director of the Asia Pacific region for the IMF. And when you were there, there was a takeoff in the East Asian economies and the Southeast Asian economies. They achieved this 7 8% growth. Now, what do you, the, the misallocation that you see today, and compared to India or the Southeast Asian region that you have seen before, what exactly, how does exactly India compare with those economies at that time when you were there, when they were having their growth spurt? Well, I think if you look at this last five years, and I go back to what I said, Asia remains a growth leader. But if you look at why Asia is growing at five and a half, six percent on average, China seven, seven and a half percent the last five, six years, the reason is that Asia is doing something which has not been well recognized. And that is in the last five years, they've been financing their growth through debt. So we've seen this happen globally the last 30, 40 years. You had the Asian crisis, which is because there was debt-driven growth. You had 2008, which was clearly debt-driven growth. And now I'm a little bit concerned that the last four or five years, as you look across growth in many countries in Asia beyond China, not only China, you're seeing more debt-driven growth. I'm not saying we're looking at financial instability, but I'm saying the growth we've seen in Asia and India, the last five years have been more on the basis of debt and finance and less 
from the point of view of productivity going up. In fact, productivity growth, as I said, has been going down. And I would say India in comparison, well, I think in India the issue is one of the stock of resource misallocation, and there are many factors to this, and that needs to improve. Thank you. Um, I, if you, you want know, to... I, I would actually, you know, uh, take it up from there and uh, uh, look at the metrics uh, in the agriculture sector, for instance, mm -hmm. which is India's potential is really economic potential and sustainable growth model is really one of human potential more than anything else. And also, when you look at agriculture, um, India's in the top five, among the top five producers of pretty much 80% plus of all agricultural produce in the world, right? However, only 10% gets to the next level in terms of food processing. Um, in terms of investment, Modi government is talking about, about putting in about $100 billion uh, to double farmer incomes in six, seven years, right? About 16 billion a year. But 15 billion a year, nearly 14 to 15 billion a year, goes out in wastage, in food wastage. It's a staggering number in India. So productivity gains if there, is, uh, if there are systemic interventions and capacity building are not that hard to achieve. Uh, if we can build a supply chain model that can actually bring India up to speed with uh, a, a bunch of competing nations in this regard. I mean, you look at Brazil, for instance, and India. Brazil takes about, uh, you know, India has uh, 22 times the number of people on farms than Brazil does for only seven times more output, right? We have to figure out a way in which, I think this digitization is a very important I'll step I'll that. in that regard. Yeah. Right? So if beneficiaries can get inputs directly, is that something that can change the metric? Um, do public-private partnerships in so many sustainable activities, because ecological security in India with, with climate change and all is also economic security, you know, at the farm level. So how do we, uh, you know, build partnerships across public, private, and research institutions to deliver uh, the potential that we have. Um, Dr. Agi, I'll take you back to November 8th. As US counted votes, India counted notes. Demonetization, right? Now, what went through your mind at that very moment when you heard that news? Because for all of us who follow India, this will remain with us for probably generations, we'll be talking to our kids about, you know, that time, that day when demonetization happened. So it's, it was an event. I mean, it was it, in the annals of economic history. I don't think there has been anything like that in the modern era. What went through your mind? And did you did your worst fears come true? Or did you think that India would pull through? So tell us tell us something about that. Well, I think uh it was a bold decision on part of the Prime Minister. I think it was a right decision. The system defeated him. If you look at bankers who are siphoning and uh, basically laundering the old money to new money and taking 20% discount. So bankers were getting rich. You'd look at the politicians who were managing state-owned, uh, I'll give you UP, for example. My, uh, the other family, would basically take the old notes, give it to the transport system, and who were collecting the new notes and send it to the other family in UP. So I think the intention was good. Uh, it was the right thing to do, but the system defeated the process itself. But I just want to also add to this, uh, come back to the economic growth of India, which was discussed earlier. You have to understand, the if you look at the last five years, uh, Gini coefficient on India, which measures inequality, uh, it is going up and up. So economic growth is not benefiting the lower end and the middle class. It is, and if you look at Forbes' list of billionaires coming out, last few years India has produced the most number of billionaires than any other nation itself. So, so to, to you know, bring the discussion, 8% economic growth 
But if it's not equitable economic growth, then I think we're heading for trouble there. Excellent point. I think you know one of the motivations of we've talked now the academics are starting to write the papers on demonetization and one of them what they're looking at of course is the impact on the economy or growth but how it has actually shifted or if it has at all anything on the inequality if the black money was you suppose were hoarded by the top 20 percent or 10 percent of the population has it is it showing in the data on on uh, income distribution? But it's a it's again a fantastic topic. If anybody wants to raise a question or, or work on it, but let me now turn to one really big change and that I've been seeing over the last three years. That's digitization of the economy. India is becoming a digital economy, and that has implications not only for India but the rest of the world. And just three three indicators of that: there are 1.2 billion other numbers out of 1.25 billion population, we have 1.2 billion other numbers. The number of mobile phones in India have just hit 1 billion. So out of 1.25 billion population, there's 1 billion mobile phones. And the third is what you had referred to uh, at the Findex. 80% of Indian adults over 15 years of age have a bank account which we are reaching that 1 billion. So it's a three, triple whammy, the jam trinity, what uh, some illustrious CGD, uh, my Center for Global Development colleague, Arvind Subramanian, had coined, uh, the Jandhan, Aadhaar, and mobile trinity. How do you think, and each one I ask, uh, each one of you, and with you, doc Dr. Singh, how do you think that changes our whole conception of what an economic growth is, how the constraints are, what the productivity is? How do you see it now at, in your... In, from the inside, playing out the digital economy in the future. Okay, should I start on this? Okay, let me make another simple point. I spoke of productivity. I now speak within productivity on an issue that we are talking about, that is education. So in the new world that we're going to be in of technology, India has been a leader globally in certain aspects of technology and what is called modern services. I'm not an expert in this area, but it seems to me India is no longer a global leader in the front line of new technology in terms of research and the new modern services. And China is becoming now the global leader in that. So the issue is if India is going to retain its leadership in what is called modern services or more broadly interpreted as technology, it comes down to one issue, and that is education. And I don't simply mean education at a high level, where India has done generally well in the last 30, 40 years. In the end, it comes down to primary education, because that builds the bedrock for where people go. Now, the data tell us that the last 10 years in India, educational outcomes and achievements have declined in India. So what I would say is, yes, India has been a global leader in parts of te technology change, but my concern is that, or my question is, does India have the skills and the skilled labor that are going to be a global leader in the new areas of technology? And my concern is, I'm not sure, which means we have to be careful. So I would, I would say that we need to look at uh, physiological issues even before we get there. What we have may be enough to get us to the next level in terms of sustainable growth. For instance, uh, you know, I think at, uh, it was at the World Economic Forum in Davos that Raghuram Rajan said that uh, you know, in all these years that he spent in India and elsewhere, one of the things that occurs to him is delivery of nutrition at the, you know, at the uh, rural level. You know, we may talk about education, skilling, et cetera, et cetera. I think it starts with something basic and physiological, you know, like delivery of nutrition. Um, how do we get it to people so that we have enough youngsters you're gonna have more than 50% under 25, right? 
we already do. And how do we make sure that they can even be receptive to educational inputs that we can build based on the digitization that we are talking about, you know? So now, all of a sudden, we have uh, more than a third who have already done a digital financial transaction. But how many of them have financial literacy so they are not, you know, taken for a ride, you know? Some basic physiological issues need to be addressed. Numbers are huge, right? You're talking about 270 million people who are just farm workers, you know, who are contract workers and so on and so forth. Unless we uh, address these basic physiological issues and what we have in technology and education and skills may be enough, I think it's dissemination of it. I think we're on the right track in terms of um, getting the beneficiaries to, you know, uh, benefit, you know, or, or, or get the inputs directly. I think that's the first step, um, because too many intermediaries, uh, you know, have siphoned off too much from the system over time. I think this is an important intervention. And the next would be major uh, agricultural level reforms to build what the Prime Minister has been talking about of ENAM, which is the National Agricultural Market you know, and giving complete transparency in end market pricing so you can have an alignment between production and markets. I think we can have more than even investment-led, you can have a market-led capacity building at the, at the uh, rural level, which I think can be, um, you know, transformational. Okay. Well, let me speak first on JAM, then I'll come on the education part. I think JAM is a fantastic opportunity for the nation uh, to be able to leverage the data it has on the Aadhaar side. Uh, it has now roughly 350 million smartphones which are being leveraged, not only from communication, but also transaction perspective. What we're seeing is people are getting more and more used to on e-payments, digital payments. You go to a local grocery store, they're using it. Uh, ATM or uh, you go to uh, taxi car, they're leveraging it. So I think the cultural shift is taking place, uh, leveraging the, uh, uh, the dig digital payment. I think, but that's still not enough. Uh, and I think we need to make tremendous uh, effort to drive that in a, in a very uh, positive direction. The good thing is, is the, under the MREGAS, uh, what we are seeing is that the money is going straight directly into the bank accounts of the people who need the money and basically uh, the middlemen who were corrupt, they have been cut off. But what's fascinating is, is also is this has shifted the vote bank for BJP from middle uh, level uh, business, uh, middle class business or small mompa shop business people to masses itself. And that was by design because I think they realized that next election you need the masses and they have completely, I would say, uh, uh, undermined the Congress effort itself. Well, on the education side, I agree that uh, uh, on the primary education is completely broken. But you have to understand the two different levels. You have the government primary education and you have the private sector. I think private sector is, is raising the bar, but that's only for affluent people. The cost trying to get into the school is a challenge itself. It's a big, big money-making machine, uh, not only for uh, business people, but politicians. So I think... Uh, Unless we find, bridge that gap between the two, you'll see the uh, discrepancy going further and further. And, and when you look at the overall economic growth happening, is that people who'll be making money and rest are still laggard in the overall economy. No, that's, that's, a, that's a really important point. And I would say that it's not only education, but also health. About 50% of small hospitals are probably owned by politicians or bureaucrats and their wives. So it's, it's important to understand that the supply of these two things are, uh, on the private sector itself is not a free market. But the, thank you for bringing that up. I would, this is the last round and I'll, then I'll open up for questions. Uh, we'll break for co a coffee at three. But one quick thought from each one of you and starting with you, Dr. Agi. You mentioned the political cycle. It's like last year, last time I, I landed up in DC in 2013 and until 2014, I don't think how many seminars were there as to who is going to come and if Modi is going to come and what is going to happen to reform. Next year, run up and beyond. What does it look like for you? And we'll come to the rest of the panelists. Well, I think uh, you have to look at uh, what's happening in uh, mid-May Karnataka election. Um, 
you know, odds are uh, less in favor of uh, BJP winning that is, you know, depending on, it's a very cost-based uh, uh, vote bank there. Uh, then you have three other important uh, state coming for election, which is Rajasthan, Madhya Pradesh. And, and it's, it's, it'll be interesting to see, and all those signs are that it'll be tough for BJP to come into that. Uh, so I think what I'm leaning towards is, is are we going to see some major reforms from now till next year's election? The answer is no. I think the government is already moving on to a very populist process, trying to do things to make sure that the vote bank, the base, is, is, is able to provide that support. But what's interesting is, is it's not the economic uh, impact which is going to decide the vote. The trend I'm seeing is, is, is the polarization of Hindu vote and, and Muslim votes itself. And I think that's where we're seeing is a very, very strong trend taking place where you're trying to basically, I mean, so the Babri Majid issue is in the Supreme Court. We're going to hear that next month itself. And, and so that's the concern I have, but I think that's where the government is going to leverage the vote bank, is the Hindu vote or the Muslim vote. You so. know, as I said before, uh, when I opened that, you know, in this next one year, things are going to turn basically on, I completely agree, it's, it's going to turn on messaging, not necessarily any meaningful reforms. And, uh, and it may not even, economic issues may not even matter, right? And how they, um, how they finesse it for the public uh, is what would matter. But be that as it may, I mean, as fragmented as the oppos opposition is at this point, I do believe that, you know, ma the macro story of India is going to continue. The finessing of focus may be different in different areas, but I think reforms are here to stay regardless of which government comes in. I think uh, the path will be uh, to sort of, the pace of reforms may be different. I think Rick had written a note uh, at some point that, you know, of the nine out of 30 top reforms that have happened, almost all of them uh, in the Modi government happened in the first year. You know, after that, it's just been sort of on auto. Um, so if, if at all any other government, I highly doubt it, uh, I think Modi is in for a longer term. But if uh, that were to happen, the macroeconomic story is not going to change. Uh, let me just say, uh, picking up on what you just said, I think the desire for reforms in India has got deeply embedded in India. And uh, the parties recognize that. So my own sense is, you may even see competition between political parties about reforms. I don't think this is a problem for reforms. I think the reform agenda is underway. The governments recognize there is a desire for reforms. And I think there's going to be a drive forward uh, in the next five years. Excellent. On that note, over to all of you. Uh, please identify yourself. And if you have a question, for a particular member of the panel, please direct that. Um, I'll take a couple, um, and then maybe we can share it. And uh, the gentleman at the back. Um. Uh, Stanley, <coughs> Stanley Cove, George Tad alum. Two um, quick questions. Um, there was a run on banking ATMs this week. Um, this appears to be not just a shortage of cash, but a loss of faith in the banking system. I'm reading about a sizable increase in non-performing loans, and people just don't want to keep their money in the banks. Second question, um, budget deficit. I'm reading it's over 6% of GDP. That's twice Maastricht criteria. This is not sustainable. That means austerity. How will that austerity be achieved can it be politically accepted by the people of India? Excellent. Uh, if there is another question, then we'll take that and then we'll come back to the panelists. Uh, the gentleman in the middle row, middle row here. Yeah, please. Hi, I'm Madan. I'm an MBA student. Uh, you talked about productivity and stuff. Like, I mean, if you look at US markets, basically the 
markets are becoming the manufacturing is becoming more productive but the number of people employed the, by the manufacturing sector is going down because of the automation and stuff what happens to that in india if like if you want the indian manufacturing to become, to become productive then the people will not be employed as much but the output might go up so what will be the impact so uh, bank i'll start with dr agi um, do you think it's a it's a reflection of india's very well publicized non performing assets or is it something deeper well um, i i think uh, this is more of a hoarding of cash and as of this morning i was reading that uh, is kind of settled down um i think the government has made an effort they put in 32 billion dollars uh into recapitalization the numbers are much much bigger it doesn't solve the issue itself but i think the 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 issue is is not just the uh, non performing assets of the bank itself i think the issue is when does the government privatize these banks you know you can't have a government uh, running back to itself and becomes what it calls a retirement for bureaucrats to become chairman and and ceos of these banks where they have absolutely no idea of what they're doing so i think that's a bigger issue uh in regards to uh, uh 6% of the deficit i think it's too early to say that because uh you know at least this this finance minister uh jaitley is quite conscious that is more into making sure that the ratings agencies they may, they want to maintain and keep on improving itself i think they want to be able to borrow money at a much much lower rate so i think with time i'm hopeful that they'll maintain their commitment to 3% deficit a fiscal deficit itself we'll see but my gut feeling is is as the election comes closer they may lose the purse to able to buy the world bank itself great um i would have come to the budget deficit to you dr singh but uh, let me uh throw the question of productivity and how does new technology and automation the question that was there um could you please address that and see how from your perspective what's the future you know the opportunity for manufacturing is i think immense in india you know i think it's at the confluence of agriculture i'll come back to it again where i think the biggest potential for manufacturing is you know like i said before only 10% of the food produced is even processed you know and we have um a, a value chains that can uh, reside entirely in india and bring it to market there's such a huge market and potential whether it is for agroforestry in a wood based value uh, chain or in foods you know there is just uh, an immense opportunity if manufacturing would just seize upon it you know i don't th- it'll just be i think it'll be a net accretive when it comes to jobs um which i think is where the make in india initiative you know um uh, straddles that sphere you know of doubling incomes um creating a rural economy that hums i mean it's hard to talk about india as a sustainable economic model without talking about the rural story i think there is immense potential for manufacturing without uh, it being a job negative uh, great um just on the budget deficit but i'll also add because of your membership of the finance commission would you address the gentleman's concern about fiscal profligacy uh, if i may use the term through some some kind of uh, incentive built into a finance commission devolution would you would you consider that well if i may also start with this point on non performing loans they briefly i think you're going back i think that is right and i think the issue is not just india but across asia and china there is a problem and that is because they've had dead driven growth the last five years and we're seeing that in china we're seeing it in india and that's a reality this debt needs to be restructured in india too you cannot have sustainable growth and rising potential growth unless you have financial conditions are supportive to make financial conditions supportive and to have credit availability going to the right sectors and the highly productive sectors you've got to restructure that debt and you've got to make sure that the new credit goes to the highly productive sectors the issue on the fiscal side you know i would not myself be too concerned for two reasons one is 
that the finance minister in his last recent budget speech, in his finance bill, has accepted medium-term targets on deficit and debt. And I think they're going to try to achieve those. So that has been set. There is a acceptance politically on the deficit and the central government debt. Now, on the issue of austerity and what that means, uh, leaving aside the next one or two years, fundamentally overall, growth is in no country can depend on government investment. It needs high productive investment, which could be from government or private sources, but in few countries, the last 50 years, have you seen sustainable growth resulting from government investment? So you didn't ask, answer my question, which I pointedly put at you, that whether the it's, Finance Commission... It's, <laughs> it's too early. I've just joined the commission. They're just starting its work. Uh, uh, I, I totally accept that. Um, there is, there is a, a, if there's a second round, we'll take a second round of questions, and then we'll close with maybe some quick remarks. Yes, please. Thank you. I'm Nikhil. I'm a student here at Georgetown from Mumbai. Um, we've spoken, you've spoken at length about, uh, about uh, the government and debt, and specifically the central government's debt. And I think there's broad consensus amongst the three of you that the central government will e eventually meet its, uh, t its target on debt and, and the budget more broadly. But that's not the whole story. There's also the state governments, which are decidedly less than, I would say, responsible. Uh, I mean, you see all these different states with loan waivers. Assam's just started. Yeah, just yeah. Quick. Sorry. Um, do you think uh, the state government spending will will hamper the central government's desire to meet those targets? Excellent. So, it, is the state is the center good? States profligate, or are both guilty? Okay, good. Um, yes, the gentleman at the back. You talked about the future of productivity in India, but I was curious if you could um, talk about that considering the dimension of gender and the fact that the labor force participation rate of women has been declining. And I'm just curious what you think the implications are of that and how that might threaten that. Okay, on the uh, state question to you, sir. That's and, easy. Uh, yes, that's easy. <laughs> <laughs> it's easy because, you know, let's not overdo the states are, there's uh, almost every, I think every state in India has accepted a state-level fiscal responsibility law that sets targets on fiscal deficits and debt. So I, I wouldn't worry uh, too much about that. They have their laws. They may not be to see how they're being enforced, but each state has accepted the need for a legislation in the, each state on the debt. Um, Maybe just so, a quick addition to that. Yes. There are probably seven states out of 29 that are uh, the biggest drags on any economic metric that we have, you know, they have the most poor and, you know, it's just the Kabel states uh, for the most part. But uh, just to uh, restate your uh, question, I want to make sure I understood it right. It's about gender disparity, right? Yeah. It's about... Just cu curious if you could comment on, you talked about good, yeah, good outlook for productivity, even potentially in manufacturing, but what that might mean considering the kind of puzzling trend with women. Yes, yes, and it's not a very um, you know, happy circumstance at all with the gender ratios uh, in, in countries like India and China. Um, in India in particular, and uh, one of the things that's heartening that I found, I think to start from the you know, lowest uh, rung uh, in, in the economic model, if you will, um, one of the first things that this government said when they came to power is that they would accept Dr. M. S. Swaminathan's recommendations on, uh, you know, improving farmer uh, incomes and productivity. That's a huge showcase for them. Dr. Swaminathan, you know, you may know, uh, spearheaded the first green revolution in India. Uh, he is a very eminent name in, you know, agricultural economics. Now, one of the things, one of the uh, primary recommendations is to empower female farmers more, right? So even before getting to manufacturing, I think at the very basic level, empowerment of female farmers 
gives them an opportunity, females at the farming level, gives them an opportunity to, you know, go up the value chain a little, you know. Um, I think that is what is very, very critical uh, to do. And I think you will see some of that $100 billion that they've earmarked for doubling farmer incomes initiative um, be, uh, uh, be directed towards that particular goal, you know. And there are many, you know, reservations like affirmative action here it is a very hotly debated topic in India. And, uh, but you know, it is, it is what it is. It, you see more women, you know, coming to fore at this point and uh, being a part of contributors to the economy and being counted, you know, they were always contributors, but now being counted will be the next step with these initiatives, I think. Dr. Agi, last word and whatever you want to end with. We'd be happy with. Well, I just want to say that uh, uh, India on its economic trajectory is moving in the right direction. Uh, it's a democracy, and, and, and basically you have to pass some of these reforms, especially on, on the land and labor through a process which is, I would say, disjointed, but you, know, you have to find the right compromise to move forward itself. And, and, and you know, we have seen uh, economies like China, which is, you know, is, 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 is an autocracy which is driven by state-owned companies itself. Whereas in India, you know, as, as uh, Patrick Mohanan, uh, Mohanan said, that it's a functional anarchy. And, and, and we have to keep on driving uh, the, uh, the parliamentary process to drive the economy. I think it will be a slow process, but it will be the right process because any government which has come in has never turned the reform back at all. They just kept on moving forward. So I'm very optimistic. On that optimistic note, um, I think we are, we have come, run out of time. So uh, we'll break on that and a big hand to all our panelists. And I hope you have taken something away. <laughs>